Good morning, church. We're so glad that you've joined us for worship today. If this is your first time, you can get on our website to find our welcome page if you have questions or want to get connected. Tonight, our youth group will have a hangout time from 6 to 7.30 like usual at the church, but our preteens will hold off on meeting until next week. On June 11th through 13th, we're hosting our first ever preteen retreat for current 5th and 6th graders. We'll feed them dinner and then play some fun rec games and do devotional times as we connect together as a group. Our senior adults are hosting dinner and a movie on Friday, June 18th. Dinner will be downstairs at 5 p.m. and you can sign up for your meal online. Our Vacation Bible School this year is Olympics themed. Kids ages three years up through incoming fifth graders are invited to join us to rotate through stations of music and fun snacks and rec games as we learn about Bible stories and how to be a champion. Our stations this year will be on Monday through Thursday with our final night on Friday evening being a huge celebration of our closing ceremonies in the parking lot. Everyone's invited to attend as we celebrate the ending of our VBS with a dunk tank inflatables, and dinner for the whole family. We'd love for you to sign up online to volunteer because this is the type of event that has a lot of people from our community walk through the doors, and we really love your help in hosting these families. We're wrapping up our sermon series this week called Then I Met Jesus, and we're going to be looking specifically at what to do if we have doubts and questions about faith. In Psalm 34, 8, it says, Come taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in Him and we'll be centering our message today around that verse. Will you pray with me? God, we're so grateful for the way that you accept us no matter where we are in our faith. You take our questions and our doubts and you help us to work through it. And whenever we seek out the truth, we find you. Help us to grow in our faith and our knowledge of you and to know that even whenever there's things that we don't understand, you're sovereign over all of it. You walk with us and you love us, and you lead us, and we're so grateful. Amen. Hey, everybody. Welcome to worship. So we've been talking for the last several weeks. Then I met Jesus. It's so important because your story of how you came to know the Lord, for one thing, it gives you assurance. It helps you know for those inevitable times that come when you wonder, am I really a believer? Am I really in? Am I really part of the family of God? You can go back to what you know is that first moment when you could say, no, I know Jesus. And so you know your story. You, you identify how you came to know the Lord in the first place. You identify, you identify what your life was like before in that moment when you, when you knew and then how your life has changed. And there's power in that, not only for you, also for the people that you share your story with. Because there are a lot of people who think to themselves, I'm glad you've got it. I just don't know if it's for me. I don't know if I'm eligible. I don't know if it's offered. I don't know if I've already wasted my moment and I'll never get it back. But when they hear your story, when they hear my story, suddenly there's hope. Hope that if God could do that for him, maybe God can do this for me. And so I want to wrap our time together in the Then I Met Jesus with this one. And the title for today's time together is Come and See. Come and See. Now there's there's been a lot of a lot of back and forth around the idea of Christians who are come and see type Christians and Christians who are go and tell type Christians. When I say come and see, I'm not saying just bring your friends to church. I'm not saying just bring your friends for me to share the gospel with them. I'm saying what would it be like if you could invite the people you love to just taste and see that the Lord is good. Come and experiment with the Lord. What would it be like to offer yourself to Him and just see, just see what God is able and willing to do in their lives. And so I've got some, some questions to invite you into to, to shape our time together. So question number one is this, what if you really don't know? What if you really have this, this question mark in your soul that says, you know, I, I, I want to know Jesus. I think I know Jesus. 
I hope I know Jesus. I'm just not sure if I know Jesus. What if you really don't know? What, what if you have genuine doubts? What if, as a person who does know Jesus, you've, you've acknowledged, I'm a sinner, I need a Savior. And yet there's some things that you really wonder about. Things that, things that if someone were to ask you, you don't know if you have the, the Bible answer. You don't know if you have the right answer for. Things that, things that your friends don't understand or, or wonder about with respect to Christianity. And you actually wonder about them too. It can leave you with a lot of questions. And then the third question, what can you really know for sure? What can you know for sure? Now, now I'll grant you that, that to take a message and offer you those questions sounds like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the, the be-all and end-all of, of, of every question you could ever have, every doubt that you could ever face, and how to fix that, how to come up against it. What I'm going to do instead is give you a framework, I hope, that helps you with it. So let me just invite you into this. In John chapter 1, John chapter 1, there is this recurring thing that keeps happening. In John chapter 1, you know, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's the famous part. But as you go on further in John chapter 1, it's a very long chapter, you get to a place where John the Baptist, right, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John the Baptist is, is telling his disciples, John saw, it's verse 29, John 1, 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me. He was before me. I myself did not know him. But the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed. And then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And I myself did not know him. But the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain, he is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I've seen him. I've seen. And the Holy Spirit, I've seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. The next day John was there again. Two of his disciples were with him. And when he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God, the Lamb of God. And when the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. That's kind of a technical term. I mean, it's, a, it's just a behavioral term. They followed Jesus, just what they did. But it's also kind of a technical term. They stopped following John, exactly, and they started following Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them, saw them following, and he asked this, Jesus, what do you want? I, I just like that, Jesus what do you want? And they said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And again, technical term, kind of. They're not just asking, you know, where he's sleeping. They're not just asking where he's living. When they say, where are you staying? They're saying, they're saying what's your life about? That, that's what they're asking. They're, they're, they're asking him, what are you about? What, 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 are you, what are you accomplishing? Where do you remain? Where do you stand? And Jesus simply says, and I love this, verse 39, John 1, 39, Jesus says, come and you will see. Come and see. Come check it out. Come see. Uh, come and you'll see. And, and you'll understand. And you'll have a chance to evaluate. And, and decide for yourself, is this a guy that I want to follow? Is this a, is this a rabbi, a teacher? Is, is what he's teaching, is what he's giving out, what I want to take in? Come and see. Come and see. You go on a little further in the chapter, and this is the pattern I want to establish with you. Jesus says to John's disciples, come and see. A few verses later, a few verses later, uh, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who followed Jesus. And the first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, We have found the Messiah, that is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and he said, You are Simon, son of John. You'll be called Cephas. But the thing I want to see is, is Andrew says to Peter, Come and see. Come and see. We found the Messiah. Come and see. The next day, 
Jesus decided to leave for Galilee, finding Philip. He said, follow me. And Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. And Philip found Nathanael. And he told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? And he re Philip replies, come and see. Come and see. So, so Jesus to John's disciples and Andrew to Peter and Philip to Nathaniel, come and see. Come and see. Come and see. What I want to establish with you there is it's valid. It's a good thing to say. It's a good tool as you invite the people that you love to fall in love with the one that you found, it's a good thing to say, come and see. You don't have to take my word for it. Come and see. A few chapters later, Jesus has that famous encounter with the woman at the well, the woman of Samaria. And they have this discussion and, and Jesus invites her to, to hear more. And she's asking more questions. And, and, and here's what the woman of Samaria, the woman at the well, goes back to her town and tells all her friends, all her neighbors. She says, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? Which is a great question because, because come and see a man who told me everything I ever did says this. If he knows everything I did, and he still came to me? Maybe he knows everything you've ever done, and he's still willing to come to you. I, I, I love the picture when, when Matthew, uh, Jesus calls him, he, he's a tax collector. He's a tax collector, and Jesus sees him there, and he says, come and follow me. And the first thing Matthew does is he has a party, and he invites Jesus, and he invites all of his lost friends. And... and and his lost friends are pretty lost. They're tax collectors. They're sinners. And Jesus, it sets Jesus up for this beautiful quote. He says, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Come and see. Just come and see. Come and see. I, I don't know if you remember the story of Zacchaeus, the wee little man who climbs a tree because he's just desperate to see Jesus. And when Jesus sees him there in the tree. He says, Zacchaeus, come down. I'm going to your house today. Come and see. Come and see. There's even a cosmic telling of this. I love this one. In Revelation, when Jesus says to, says to John the Revelator, he says, he says, come up and I'll show you everything that will happen after this. Come and see is a big deal in Scripture. It's a big deal in the life and ministry of Jesus, and it's a great instrument in your hands as you invite people you know to experience what you've experienced in Jesus. So let me take you to Psalm 34. Psalm 34, I got it marked in my Bible. There's a beautiful line there in Psalm 34, verse 8. It's, it's, it's what Amanda read to you at the start of our time together. Come taste and see that the Lord is good. Come, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in Him. I want to invite you into Psalm 34 because it really lays out what it looks like when, when someone who has had a genuine encounter with God, a life-changing encounter with God, shares their story and invites people they love into it. So I want to start at verse 4. Psalm 34, verse 4. I sought the Lord, and He answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to Him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called, and the Lord heard him, and the Lord saved him out of all of his troubles. And the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear Him, and... He delivers them. Come, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in Him. I want to invite you to hear this again in that understanding of my life before I came to know Jesus, how I came to know the Lord, and my life since then. The psalmist tells you right here, the psalmist tells you, he says, look, I sought the Lord and He answered me and He delivered me from all my fears, 
uh, I, I was no longer covered with shame. He saved me out of, all of, out of all of my troubles. This poor man. What was your life like before you came to know Jesus? And, and David here in Psalm 34, he says, look, my life before all that, my life before that encounter with God, it was marked with fear. Fear of tomorrow, fear of what was, fear of what will be. Fear is a powerful shaper of life for an awful lot of people, David included. I sought the Lord and He answered me and He delivered me from all my fears because fear, fear was on the top of the page when you started asking me what my life was like. But that's not the only thing. That's not the only thing. Those who look to him are radiant. Their face is never covered with shame. Because David, like me, maybe like you, knew what it was to have, to carry, to, to live under a cloak of, of shame. Now, yours may be different than mine. Ours may be different than David's. But we are no strangers to those secrets that we really want to keep hidden away from anyone else who's important to us, anyone else who might by chance love us for fear that if they knew, they wouldn't love us anymore. Fear and shame. A shame that allows you to live half a life. A shame that causes you to, to cut off exposure what was your life like before you came to know Jesus? In Psalm 34, David mentions fear and shame and want. This poor man called. <laughs> what else was I going to do? I didn't have anywhere else to turn. David talks about a poverty of spirit, uh, and maybe a poverty of resources as well. You know, I think, I think God does allow us to get past the point of solving our own problems. People say it all the time, God will never give you more than you can bear. I disagree. I disagree on the authority of Scripture. God will allow you to endure more than you can endure so that you'll turn to Him, so that I would, would look to Him and say, God, I give up. I surrender. I can't handle this. Maybe that's where you are. Maybe that's where people you love are. And David says, This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him. Fear, shame, want, trouble saved him out of all of his troubles. Out of all of his troubles. Wow. God showed up, met me in my trouble, in my fear, in my shame. He met me. God met me where I am. And then he goes on. My life since then. Look at the descriptors that David puts on his own life in this newfound relationship, this newfound place with God. I sought the Lord and he answered me and he delivered me. That's a powerful word. That's a powerful notion that God somehow came to my rescue. That God somehow stepped in and, and imposed himself between me and all the things that were consuming me. God showed up. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. I love it. I, I don't know if you know this, but there's a story where Moses, after spending time with God, his face is so radiant that the people who see him, they know he's been in the presence of God. They can see it on his face. They can, they can sense it in his demeanor. It's almost a, an aroma that is emanating from him. And, and that's how it is sometimes when, when people have this encounter with God. It just becomes this, this aura around them. Don't, don't take that the wrong way. I'm talking about the presence of God that just sort of comes out from you. 
He says, he says, he delivered me. He made me radiant. He says this, he says, he saved me. This poor man called and the Lord heard him and he saved him out of all of his troubles. Now, I'm not trying to read a New Testament concept back into an Old Testament passage. What I'm saying is that God showed up and in the showing up changed everything, changed everything, delivered radiant, saved. And if you wanted one word to encapsulate it all, he says this. He says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Blessed with an ongoing presence of God. God with me. God in me, God for me, God loves me. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. So let me go back to those questions for a minute. Questions. What if you really don't know? I think God is perfectly fine with that. Big enough for you to come to him, though he is the God of the universe. God God is big enough for you to come and taste and see. God is willing for you to sit with Him for a while before you sign on and say, God, I want to give, I want to give the control of my life over to you. So you come and see, just like Jesus said to those disciples of John, come and see. Come and see what life with me would be like. Come and see. Come and see what I teach. Come and see where I live. Come and see what I stand for. Come and see what life with me might look like. Come and see. God is perfectly fine with you taking a while to figure this out. I don't know if you've, I don't know if you've thought about the, the terms atheist, agnostic, Christian. The one says, there is no God. The, one, the other says, there is a God and I know him by name and he knows me. In between, there is this time of unknowing. Maybe that's where some of your friends are. Maybe, maybe that's where you are. You know there's something. You're, 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 not, you're, not, you're not in the ditch on the side of the road that says, no, there's nothing other than what I can see. And, Maybe you're in that middle saying, I just don't know. I just don't know. That's a good, honest place to be. Can I tell you that? That's a good, honest place to be. But it's not where you want to live. And so you come and you experience and you experiment and you taste and you see. And I think, I think God's going to show up. I think God's going to answer some of those questions. Maybe it takes a little time, but in an honest pursuit as you ask and seek and knock, God is true to answer and open and come in. So what if you have genuine doubts? What if you do have genuine doubts? I say you take them to the Lord. I say you lay them out before God. God, how does this work? God. I don't know about creation. God, I don't know about how science and faith fit together. God, I don't know. I don't know how all of this, how all of this comes together to make a life that I can live with integrity, that I can teach to my children, that I can, that I can prompt to my friends. I say God's big enough for your questions. And so you come and you see and you taste and you know. And and, and you give God. Nobody said you have to get this 100% right from the very first second. Faith is a gift. So receive it. Receive it. What can you know for sure? Well, what you can know for sure is that God loves you. What you can know for sure is that God is bigger than your questions and your doubts and your fears. What you can know for sure is that God is not working on my clock. God is working on eternity. 
and He is willing to hear your thoughts, hear your doubts, hear your fears. He's big enough, big enough to meet you where you are. And not only you, but the people you love. Can, can I pray that over you? So Lord, in Jesus' name, <laughs> in Jesus' name, would you meet me where I am? God, I don't even know all there is to know about you. Parenthetically, no one does. No one does. So if you were to pray a prayer, Lord, I don't know all there is to know about you. But what I do know, I want to follow. I want to come. I want to see. God, would you show me? Would you give me eyes to see? Would you give me a heart to receive as you reveal yourself to me? And maybe if God has shown enough of himself to you, maybe you're ready even now to take that next step and say, God, I get it. I don't get it all, but I get enough to say, you are my God. I give my life to you. God, from here on out, lead me. I am yours. That's my prayer for you. That's my prayer for the people you love, that we would all meet Jesus. I love you, and I love being your pastor. See ya.